Okay. So this was what the people of Columbine heard, and my wife was right. I wish I had cleaned my glasses before I start. If you'll allow me to call the mass outpouring of anger and hostility which characterizes our institutions of public schooling, the Columbine phenomenon, and I mean not just instances of carnage and arson, drugs and sexual assaults, but the whole gamut of generalized hostilities which pass before a teacher's eyes, then a great part of the responsibility for our Columbines can be attributed to the infrastructure of schooling itself. We took the wrong road in schooling about a hundred years ago when we made its disciplines forced and we put instruction into the hands of professionalized strangers. I'm sure many of you here are parents and of course all of you have been students at one time or another. How many of you actually knew anything at all about the teachers who preempted your life. How could that possibly be? It has to be the most radical piece of social engineering or one of them in the history of mankind. That you turn your child over to a succession of absolute strangers and you might say, well, the state knows who they are and I'm here to tell you they don't. I began as a, <laughs> I began as a school teacher. Now I think I'm past the statute of limitations on this. I was an advertising copywriter and my roommate was a school teacher and he taught one day and went into the restaurant business. He said you'd have to be crazy to do that for a living. <laughs> so uh, in between ad jobs, uh, I took his license that he had pitched into the drawer and I started to substitute around. Nobody ever bothered to check to find out who I was, was who I said I was. Uh, I'll probably hear from the district attorney and, and I'll tell him in advance I'm going to deny saying this. <laughs> There's another fat guy wandering around who look, looks just like me. So, so we took the wrong road in schooling when we put instruction into the hands of professionalized strangers. We piled mistake upon mistake after that, overemphasizing the training that school could deliver, ringing bells in children's ears, extending childhood further and further into the most vigorous part of life mathematically segregating kids according to the alchemy of standardized test scores and finally committing the worst mistake of all yoking the world of work to the world of schooling forcing a connection which simply does not exist and when we come to transcend our columbines it will be because we awaken from this self-induced nightmare and act out of two bedrock principles. One, that nobody can educate you except yourself. Surely our universal individual experiences confirm that one. And two, that over-organization precipitates entropy, the disintegration of order. It's a direct byproduct of overorganization. That's a principle of thermodynamics, which translated into everyday life means simply that craziness increases in closed systems shut off from the outside. Washington, D.C. is, of course, a prominent example of this. <laughs> For more years than any of us like to think about, inmates in schools have been shooting each other. Mind you, it is not a recent phenomenon. Since 1990, 267 people have been murdered inside our public schools. Now, for a long time, the press undertook a gentleman's and gentlewoman's agreement to, to be quiet about this. But of the 267 killed, you don't begin to understand the thousands who have been killed from encounters in school 
the termination of which takes place outside of the building. Anyway, or committing arson or planting drugs on their teachers. That only happened to me twice. And avoiding the <laughs> common standards of decent behavior in a number of other ways, all in order to express their hatred of these places. As a school teacher, I can tell you, it's almost axiomatic that when you meet a rotten kid on the street after school, he's usually as friendly and polite as anyone else interested in what you're doing. In so-called good schools with no visible disruption, like PS 87 nearby, the disintegration of civility takes different forms, but it's there just the same. When American schooling stopped being primarily for mental development and character training, as the man or woman on the street would understand those things, it became a training ground to supply the existing economy with a particular kind of labor and customers that it needed. One buried byproduct of this shift was to sabotage free market principles because by conditioning children to what is instead of what could be, it heavily subsidized existing commerce and social political dispositions. It insulated them against future competition by indoctrinating children in what is and how to succeed with what is. Academic schooling of the past did not do that anywhere near the degree that modern school practice attempts. Another thing that happened to schools is they became large institutional analogs to factories is that the enterprise became a colossal works project one in which passing out jobs became an end in itself, often jobs with the most tenuous connection to the needs of young people. School is training for work or is training to be a consumer, but never an independent producer or to sustain a mandated jobs pyramid. Schooling as any of these things requires tight control to prevent unwanted personal initiative. It requires top-down management. The difficulty here is that education, as contrasted with schooling, cries out for self-management. Indeed, it can be argued that the only practical reason to seek education is to achieve this end of becoming a self-manager. And I'm not trying to play word games here. The principle that nobody can educate you except yourself is as old as the hills. You can be trained from outside, but only educated from within.